Welcome all fellow hams. We're going to do another little study session tonight on the uh, element 4 extra class. Finish up a couple questions and start on another chapter. So we'll, uh, without further ado, let's get right into it. Appreciate everybody sticking around, uh, coming back and joining in with me. I'm going to upload this one, obviously, but uh, I still plan on doing some more lives, uh, keep growing the channel as I can, and uh, we'll see where things take from there. So let's uh, get in back into the study session here. Uh, switch over my camera view. All right, continue on with our 2020-24 Gordon West Element 4 extra class we've gone through quite a bit uh, as you can see gotten through quite a bit of the questions we're on to uh, we're still on receivers with great filters uh, chapter so let me grab that because I want that so we're, let's get right into it so our next question here what is meant by direct digital conversion as applied to software defined radios? A. Software is converted from source code to object uh, or to object code during operation of the receiver. B. Incoming RF is converted to a control voltage for voltage controlled oscillator. C. Incoming RF is digitized by an analog to digital converter without being mixed with local oscillator signal or D a switching mixer is used to generate I and Q signals directly from the RF input so direct digital conversion is a method that has only been technologically feasible in very recent years as the analog to digital sampling process is done at the antenna input at the radio frequencies. This method allows for extremely high performance and versatility but is subject to all the limitations of an A to D sampling scheme such as uh, aliasing. Uh, I probably mispronouncing that. I don't know why I can't seem to pronounce tonight. So the answer is C. So what is meant by direct digital conversion as applied to software defined radios? Answer C. Incoming RF is digitized by an analog to digital converter without being mixed with local oscillator signal. I'm thinking the word like anti uh but it's not. There's not anti in there so I, I don't know why I'm not pronouncing that so bear with me. I apologize. So, the HF radio here in the picture, the radio head works Wi-Fi to the SDR black box in your shack. Great for laptop operation. And of course, it's a maestro. <laughs> the, the jewel of all SDR. Wow, your flex radio is there. So, let's see here. Our next one here. What is dither with respect to analog to digital converters? A. An abnormal condition where the converter cannot settle on a value to represent the signal. B. A small amount of noise added to the input signal to allow more precise representation of the signal over time. C. An error caused by irregular quanti quantization. Uh, quanti 
quantization step size, sorry, and D, a method of dissemination by randomly skipping samples. In one of the life's strange paradoxes, we can reduce noise in a digital sampler by introducing noise in reality. This simple con this simply converts one type of noise into much less obnoxious form. Adding a tiny bit of random noise overcomes the natural hysteri uh, hysteria in any sampling system. So the correct answer is B. What is dither with respect to analog to digital converters? B. A small amount of noise added to the input signal to allow more precise representation of signal over time. I truly do apologize. The backwoods is coming out tonight and preventing me from pronouncing things correctly. Alright. What looks to be the last question in this chapter. So, an SDR receiver is overloaded when input signals exceed what level? One half the maximum sample rate. B, one half the maximum sampling buffer size. C, the maximum count value of the analog to digital converter. Or D, the reference voltage of the analog to digital converter. The first thing a signal sees when encountering an analog to digital converter is a string or ladder of comparisons. As the name suggests, the comparators compare the incoming signal analog voltage to reference voltage. When the incoming signal voltage exceeds the reference voltage, the SDR receiver is overloaded and the analog to digital converter can accept no additional input. So the correct answer is D. So an SDR receiver is overloaded when the input signal exceeds what level? D, the reference voltage of the analog to digital converter. And of course, you know, it's got a good uh, food for thought here. On this page, improving your... Uh, I, I and Q is a good to know here. He says one color big screen does it all. From logging contacts to checking propagation charts, checking for duplicate contacts, to working with the radio's controls, all from one small SDR box hidden below the console. So you can kind of see it all put on there. And it just talks about if you've worked at all with your uh, software-defined radios, digital signal processing, DSP, you've heard of the terms I and Q tossed around. What are the team What do these mean, and why are they so important? While I and Q modulation and demodulation are certainly integral to digital communications, I and Q methods have been around for ages in analog communi uh, communication systems. I and Q simply mean in phase and quadrature, which is the phase shift of 90 electrical degrees. Having two detectors and a receiving running in 90 degree quadrature allows you to unambiguously determine the phase angle of any radio signal as opposed to a conventional detector the only, that only gives you amplitude information. So. That your in phase and quadrature is what your I and Q are. So that's a good little tidbit. And moving on to our next chapter here oscillate and synthesize this. Um, so obviously it's going to get into some of your spectrum scopes and analyzers and uh, being able to synthesize your signals. 
What are three oscillator circuits used in amateur radio equipment? A. Taft, Pierce, and negative feedback. B. Pierce, Fenner, and Bean. C. Taft, Hartley, and Pierce. Or D. Colpitts, Hartley, and Pierce. Colpitts oscillators have a capacitor, just like C in the name. Hartley is tapped, and the Pierce oscillator used crystals. So your correct answer is D, and it kind of gives you why and shows you a little bit of a schematic here. Three to the three main types. So in this ta in this table shows you the Pierce, which Pierce have uses crystals. Your Hartleys are tapped, and your coal pits have capacitors. So C for capacitors is coal pits type of oscillator. Your Pierce, I don't know, think maybe if you're looking at a crystal, the light reflection could pierce, you know, it can you know, be real strong, pierce through the light. I, I don't know, maybe that's a way. And uh, so, what are the three oscillator circuits used in amateur radio equipment? Correct answer is D, Colpitts, Hartley, and Pierce. So, how is positive feedback supplied in a Hartley oscillator? A, through a tapped coil. B, through a capacitive divider. C through a link coupler or D through a neutralizing capacitor. Hartley is always tapped. The tapped coil provides inductive coupling for positive feedback. Look at the schematic above for A. <coughs> for uh, the answer is A, which is Hartley. So how was positive feedback supplied in a ha Hartley oscillator? Correct answer is A through a tapped coil which shows here on the ta on the table above schematic can I get my pages set here moving on All right. How is positive feedback supplied in a Colpitts oscillator? A through a tap coil. B through link coupling. C through a capacitive divider. Or D through a neutralizing capacitor. On Colpitts oscillator, we use capacitive divider to provide feedback. Look at the schematic on the previous page. Correct answer is C. So how how is a positive feedback supplied in a Colpitts oscillator? Answer is C through a capacitive divider. Alrighty. Next question. How is positive feedback supplied in a Pierce oscillator? A through a tap coil, B through link coupling, D or C through a neutralizing capacitor, or D through a quartz crystal. The Pierce oscillator uses a quartz crystal to obtain positive feedback. Look at the schematic on page 141. The correct answer is D. We'll kind of move this over here so we can see the good to know section. So on a Pierce, how is feedback? supplied in a Pierce oscillator? The correct answer is D through a quartz crystal. And it kind of shows each of the capacitors have a particular place in amateur radio circuitry. Hartley oscillators are often used in local oscillator circuits of radio receivers, in BFO circuits, and some audio oscillators. They're capable of fairly wide tuning ranges. The Colpitts oscillator is used in high frequency circuits such as VFOs where stability becomes more important and a bit harder to achieve 
than a Hartley. A coal pits VFO, however, requires a ganged variable capacitor and can have a tendency to quit at certain frequencies if the radio capacitance between the two variable capacitor sections is not maintained uniformly across the tuning range. Therefore, most successful coal pit VFO designs restrict the tuning range. A Pierce oscillator is the simplest of the crystal oscillators of all crystal oscillators sorry, and is used when the ultimate in frequency stability is required. However, the Pierce oscillator is not tunable. So oscillators, an oscillator is basically an amplifier with positive feedback from the output to input. So there we go. Gotta reposition here a little bit, bear with me. <clears throat> so, which of the following oscillator circuits are commonly used in VFOs? A. A Pearson Zener. C. Colpitts and Hartley. D. Armstrong and DeForest. Or, or I'm seeing, sorry, C. Or D. Negative feedback and balanced feedback. Both Colpitts and Hartley variable frequency oscillators are self excited and provide continuous smooth variable tuning in order in older VFO transceivers. Newer radios, even though they say they have a VFO, are really digitally controlled via an optical reader. They just behave as though they have a large capacitor behind that big tuning dial. So your correct answer is B. So which of the following oscillator circuits are commonly used in VFOs? Correct answer is B. Colpitts and Hartley. <clears throat> All right, moving along. Which of the following must be done to ensure that a crystal oscillator provides the frequency specified by the crystal manufacturer? A. Provide the crystal with specified parallel inductance. B. Provide the crystal with specified parallel capacitance. C. Bias the crystal at specified voltage. Or D. Bias the crystal at specified current. There is plenty of influence. There, yeah, there is plenty to influence the precise frequency of a crystal in the oscillator circuit. Crystal impedance, crystal aging, the method of holding the crystal in a place inside the can, temperature, and finally the crystal's natural parallel or holder capacitance over which you have no control, usually in the older of 6 uh, picofarad. Your circuit's parallel capacitance, which you can control usually by means of a trimmer, is another influence to consider. So the correct answer on this is B. So which of the following must be done to ensure a, that a crystal oscillator provides the frequency specified by the crystal manufacturer is B. Provide the crystal with a specified parallel capacitance. And a little good, uh, good to know note. Quartz crystals are still found in modern synthesi uh, synthesized ham radios. Some are enclosed in heated metal chambers to keep them temperature uh, compensated for spot-on digital signal work. These two quartz crystals feed reference signals to various oscillator stages in the transceiver. An oscillator output outputs a signal of constant frequency. <clears throat> I kind of feel like I'm losing my voice a little bit here all of a sudden. <clears throat> we'll finish out this page here and uh, call it a night for this one then. That'll be right around that 10 questions or so.
Which of the following components can be used to reduce thermal drift in crystal oscillators? A. NPO capacitors, or N NP0, I should say it looks like. B. Toroidal inductors. C. Wire wound resistors. Or D. Non inductive resistors. Well, this wobbles some old nostalgia glands. Lots of us home brewers spent many hours attempting to stabilize oscillators by means of temperature compensating capacitors. This is almost a lost art. An NP0 capacitor is one that has neutral thermal coefficient. It drifts neither high nor lower in capacitance as the temperature changes. NP0 actually stands for negative positive zero. Other capacitors were designed with either a positive or negative temperature coefficient to compensate for other components with the opposite temperature coefficient. <laughs> and then it says, are we having fun yet? <laughs> so on this one, the correct answer is A. So which of the following components can be used to reduce thermal drift in crystal oscillators? Answer is A, NP0 capacitors. So moving right along. What is the equivalent circuit of a quartz crystal? A. Motional capacitance, motional inductance, and loss resistance in a series all in parallel with a shunt capacitor representing electrode and stray capacitance. B. Motional capacitance, motional inductance, loss resistance, and a capacitor representing electrode and stray capacitance in a parallel. C. Motional capacitance, motional inductance, loss resistance, and a capacitor representing electrode and stray capacitance all in series. Or D. Motional inductance and loss resistance in a series paralleled with motional capacitance and a capacitor representing electrode and stray capacitance. Motional capacitance and motional inductance of a quartz crystal refers to the natural series resonance. Motional inductance is typically huge while the motional capacitance and series resistance are tiny resulting in a very large Q. This crystal forms a series of parallel resonant circuit with a trimmer capacitor or inductor to give spot on frequency. To find the correct answer out of these four choices, commit to memory, motional capacitance, motional inductance, and loss resistance in a series. And shunt capacitance representing electrode and stray capacitance will fall in pl into place. Oof. The job of a quartz crystal is important as a beating heart. Your question pool committee wants you to fully understand the complexities that go into the equivalent circuit of a quartz crystal. You can read more about this heart that is beating within your radio in the ARL handbook for radio communications. The correct answer on this is A. So what is the what is the equivalent circuit of quartz crystal? The correct answer is A. Motional capacitance, motional inductance, and loss resistance in a series, all in parallel with a shunt capacitor representing electrode and stray capacitance. And that one was a mouthful. And we'll do this as last question of the night. Which of the following is an aspect of piezoelectric effect? Pi pi piezoelectric. A. Mechanical deformation of material by the application of a voltage. B. Mechanical deformation of material by the application of a magnetic field. C. Generational or generation of electrical energy in a presence of light, 
or D, increased conductivity in the presence of light. The piezoelectric effect is crucial to nearby to nearly all we do in radio. Every quartz crystal in your computer, cell phone, ham rig relies on this property. In light of this, it's amazing that for a long time in early amateur radio, we somehow managed to get by without even knowing about this phenomenon. While you will when you apply a mechanical stress to piezoelectric material such as quartz, it generates a small DC voltage, and if you apply an electric field to that crystal, it mechanically deforms. Quartz crystals are, the, are at the heart of nearly all precision oscillators and a great number of electrical filters. They can even be used as transducers in microphones or loudspeakers? So the correct answer is A. So which of the following is an aspect of piezoelectric effect? The correct answer is A. Mechanical deformation of material by the application of a voltage. And there's that one for the night. And uh, and uh, we'll continue on with this as we go, do some more of these. But some good questions for tonight. Definitely, definitely some <laughs> mouthfuls. I got to relearn myself for uh, how to properly pronounce, I guess. So I apologize for any of the inaccuracies, but I think uh, still good going over the questions and I gotta push and get my my exam done um, soon, so I can move on to some other uh, aspects of the hobby and some other uh, things I want to get into and share. So, with that, I'll say thanks for joining me and uh, studying along with me. I'll say seven three and get on the air. <laughs>